Hello. Hello, darling. How are you? I'm very, very well, thanks. A little bit nervous, but you know. No, no. Someone like you who's so creative and been on stage and has dance and an actress and how on earth could you be nervous right now? Well, it's this whole um Instagram thing, you know, I'm I'm of a different generation and it's all very new and strange, but um I, I'm loving it. Thank you very much for inviting me. No, thank you for accepting. Um, I am so happy to have you on our platform. And just to have a little recap, you know, Self Made Girl Boss is all about women empowering women, right? And how I started this movement, shall we say, is that I reached out to women all over the world to share with me their stories. Because you see, sometimes we get so caught up in our journeys that we think we're the only person going through various traumas and situations and circumstances and what i actually found is that the more women shared their story the more other women resonated and was like actually no this has happened to me and well if she can do it then i can do it and you are such an inspiration for that because <laughs> you are because you have um been you've had your journey as we all have and i know we all have our pros and our cons but your 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 pros and your cons your cons were you know very much in the limelight and for everyone to see and for everyone to just you know throw their little 10 pence in there unnecessarily where you think to yourself who even are you to even be judging right and that's really um, difficult to, to, to have to endure and you see yourself especially in today's um, day that you know we have so much problems with mental health and mm. like even Love Island you know so many um, of the contestants and even the presenter you know committed suicide because of the fact that they felt their life was being torn apart by people they didn't even know as in the public so you are someone who can really reach out to a lot of women not only in this interview right this second as we're live and I know that it's tricky to get your head around that but believe it or not we can like literally kill all the borders all over the world and just become one right now okay I love that I know it, it's it's so interesting so I'm going to give you the invisible mic so you can just introduce yourself tell me who you are and tell me what you do and what you've done Okay, wow. Um, all right. Um, well, I'm Georgina, but you can call me Georgie because Georgina is a little bit formal. Um, I am, well, I'm known for all the things that you mentioned earlier. Um, but also, I'm, um, I'm somebody who's passionate about recovery from addiction. Um, and also, as you can see, like I make lots of art. And um, yeah, I, I'm kind of... I, I'm sort of writing a book at the moment, so um, I'm working with a ghostwriter because my two times in rehab, um, I had to write a life story as part of the therapy. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so everyone that heard it said, Georgie, you have to write a book <laughs> twice. Um, so I decided, yeah, why not? And actually, it's been a really cathartic therapeutic experience and um, very useful to, to get to learn, you know, one's patterns and um you know how we get to certain places that we never, never thought that we'd get to and all this stuff and um so i'm sort of working on that and also um a big issue in the book is sort of my view on slut shaming so when i came into the public eye this is well over 10 years ago god it's 12 years ago my god um, <laughs> And, um, you don't look a day over 16, darling. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> All the Botox places are closed. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, so when in 2008, the world was a very, very different place. And um, first of all, you had to be very, very skinny in order to be accepted. I was not at that time. And so immediately people had that to throw at me. They had, oh, she's a chubby goth. And, and then the second thing was, um, well, she's, she's kind of a slut. So she sort of really deserves, you know, to be, to be treated like this. So oh, no, it's, it's all right, you know, what they did because she's a slag and all this. And um, 
I've always had this kind of, I'm, first of all, I'm so grateful to be alive and at least in my 30s in this era because, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 35 in July and for the first time, I think in a very long time, that doesn't mean that I'm on the shelf, <laughs> you know? And um, I, I just think people really, really, really love to throw the slut word out there to each other. And unfortunately, some it, it happens between women. And um, my basic broken down view of it is, if I'm not sleeping with your husband or your boyfriend, and both parties are single or multiple parties are single, um, just mind your own business. <laughs> I think, you know what? I think people should mind their own business anyway, right? And um, sorry to cut you quickly, um, Georgie. I did a masterclass, right, which is called Start Your Own Business. And I think one of the keys in order to be able to, to start and even maintain a successful business is that you cannot care what people say about you because people are always going to say something negative about you right they're going to be like you can't do it you're too fat you come from this country english isn't your first language whatever it may be and do you know what it is most of it is jealousy because they can't do it themselves or because secretly they want something that you've got so they're trying to put you down on something that perhaps you have given off to be insecure about or something in the media right now where you have to look a certain way or yeah. you have to behave a certain way. But the bottom line is don't give a shit about what people think about you, right? At the end of the day, your happiness lies within you. No one else. Everyone else literally can go to hell and you know what there are a lot of people especially when it comes to starting your own business and you you would have experienced this no doubt that it can it can come from friends it can come from so-called friends it can come from family members it can come from uh, partners boyfriends husbands it can come from the people that you never think that can break you down and in fact those are the people that can break you down the most yeah right because they're the people that you love and you trust and you actually value their opinion, which is why you have to be so solid in your ground and be like, no, I'm not listening to this because I believe in myself. So if you want to call me a slut, fat, this or whatever, I don't care. It's got nothing. It's who, who, what's it got to do with you? Exactly. And I think what you've highlighted there is the tunnel vision that is necessary. So I'm going to do this and you are not going to stop me. And just that, like, not being blinkered by anything is so, so important. And um, I think when I first came into, you know, the public eye, I wasn't really... I was how old, sorry, how old were you when you came into the public eye? 23, you know. I, I, and, it, and it was how, 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 when was the first experience of you becoming October a celebrity? 2008, I get off a plane coming back home from Vienna I've done a like one of my horror burlesque shows with the girls and uh the press are waiting for me <laughs> I'm just like oh well, like they, they must think I'm somebody else or something and uh yeah it was just like boom and at that age I was very 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 excited by it all you know and just like oh they want to talk about me and they love me and all this you know, very Marilyn Monroe-esque I guess um, but, uh, you know, I just didn't see it, you know, like people started, I started reading comments on things and it started to slowly tear away at my self-esteem bit by bit. And there were things that I actually thought about myself already that were being, you know, reiterated by people I'd never even met before. So if I'd have known then what I know now, you know, well, my life would have turned out quite differently, but, but also I quite like that I've taken this route to be exactly where I am now because it's made me very well-rounded and knowledgeable and um, just easier to detect and handle bullshit. <laughs> you know what? I think what you have just said is 
beautiful and spot on accountability right i think we have to be a accountable for everything that we do and everything that we've experienced because i genuinely believe that accountability is one of the keys in order for you to feel free uh, free to be happy right and you said something also very important you said i do not regret any part of my journey because everything that you went through is unique to you it's you you had to you know it was your trials and tribulations it was your lessons that you had to learn it was your you saw some beautiful things as well you saw some amazing things you were with tell me about adam and the ants right you were with this sensational band back in the day that was an incredible experience that i fell into completely by accident <laughs> so um i was going out with a, a drummer from uh brazil called bruno and <laughs> bruno the brazilian yeah yeah oh, <laughs> He was a hottie. Um, anyway, so um, he was playing drums for this 80s band called Zodiac Mindwalk and the Love Reaction. And one night I show up to his gig and all of a sudden there's Adamant on stage with the band. And I'm like, Bruno, how could you not tell me that Adamant was going to be playing? And he was from Brazil. He didn't grow up knowing who he was. He just thought he was some crazy guy who like rushed the stage. Um, but anyway, so we got That's talking hilarious. afterwards. And um, yeah, he said that this was after the uh, the incident in the press and all that. And he said, "Oh, I've written a song about you and your granddad." <laughs> and so, um, for those for those who are joining in and don't know who your granddad is, your granddad is a legend, right? <laughs> Can you just please tell everyone who this amazing man is? Because obviously, I'm I'm Latin, right? So, oh, okay. right. So we we are Spanish speaking in our household. So. Manuel in Faulty Tower. Sorry, tell us who your sorry, tell us who your granddad is. <laughs> well, you've just done it, babe. But like, uh, Manuel from Faulty Towers, Andrew Sachs, the late great actor Andrew Sachs. Yes, that's hilarious. <laughs> Literally, our our family used to like be able to relate to the character in Faulty really? Towers. Not that we go around breaking plates and acting crazy, but anyway, there I'm you go. I'm really glad that you weren't insulted by it. <laughs> no, not at all, because it's really endearing. Like, you know, Spanish people that, you know, are, that speak English as their second language and have to kind of accommodate to the, you know, the English or the American culture yeah. is hilarious because we do things in our own certain way. And, you know, especially now with what's going on with racism and stuff like that. I think yeah. that we should be able to embrace all these, you know, wonderful cultures and not be offended by things because he got it spot on. You do, he did really, uh, you know, that specific kind of character that you get in, in certain Spanish households. He, he did it. He was amazing. Really? Yes, he was what? so good. Honestly, how funny. He used to get everything upside down and wrong. And it was just like, oh, no, it's a mess. But I remember, he, like, growing up, he used to, like, people used to be stunned when they found out that he wasn't Spanish. I know. I was stunned. <laughs> I didn't know he wasn't Spanish until I knew I was, you know, interviewing you and I really researched really? about you. And I, and I was like, how is it that he played Manuel and his name is Andrew Sachs? And I was like, and it like literally the penny wouldn't drop. So I don't know if I had a Manuel moment there. <laughs> no, that is a German name. Yeah. So, so what is your heritage then? Are you German? Um, I'm sort of a mishmash of a lot of different races. So I'm, um, I am, um, well, I'm Celtic, like Scottish Irish. Right. A little bit of Geordie. There's a little bit of Romi uh, Romani Gypsy somewhere. Um, and then there's uh, German. Wow. And uh, Austrian. <laughs> oh, Austrian. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way you said that. Well, you know what? It's my horrific attempt at doing that accent. So, uh, apologies to any Austrians who are watching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they forgive you. So, so Georgie, you were saying, so obviously you were going out with this extremely good looking Brazilian drummer yes, who had no friend. idea he was no. drumming for what was an icon back in the day of yeah. Adam Ants. And so I was in another band at the time, but um, Adam was um, sort of jamming with several different musicians at the time and he was doing gigs and um, I kind of muscled my way into doing backing vocals you know I just basically wouldn't take no for an answer and um, and that's how you have to be in life you've got to really if you want something go get it 
And the thing is, I couldn't really sing. <laughs> so like, I couldn't really sing. Um, I, I was in the choir at school. And when I realized that it wasn't a very cool thing to do when I was about 15, I was just like, forget it. So I didn't sing again until I was 20, 23, 24, because um, this producer came into my life who said, oh, it doesn't matter if you can't sing. Here's a CD of scales, do those. And, you know, I'll, I, and we, we sort of sewed together a song using the best bits of my voice. And, um, but then when I was in Adam's band, I had to really, really, really learn on the job. And, um, you know, by the time I left the band, I was, I was sort of decent, you know, I was, I was okay. I could blend my voice in with, with the band doing the backing vocals that I did. And after that, I went to drama school and I really trained my voice because you have to do musical theater and all that stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, it's no secret that I'm not the greatest singer in the world. Um, however, it is something that I really enjoy, but performing and me at the moment, I don't really think it's a very good idea. Why is that? Because I'm sort of, I'm, I've been in recovery for three years, but I haven't had sustained sobriety. So I've had periods of relapse. Right. And um, I think for me, because performing always included you know, the, the blowing off steam at the end of it. So it would always be like, you do a great performance, you want to have a drink and all that stuff. And I just don't see myself being able to do that without that just yet. But it is very early days for me. And, you know, all the acting training is in there. It's, I went to drama school for two years. It's there when I need it. It's not going anywhere. Um, and yeah, so what were we talking about? <laughs> I don't know, we're, ju we're jumping, we've got so much to talk about, we're literally jumping from topic to topic, but I just want to say something, that I have a, I have a very, um, I like to call him a good friend, and I work with him, and he sells some of the most beautiful art, right, he uh, is the owner of House of Fine Art, mm -hmm. and um, we have an interior design studio, so we do, you know, designs for um, the rich and wealthy, shall we say, and, um, you know, we, we had a very big project on. And so we had to travel to Milan and I really got to know him. And he said to me that he used to sing and he used to be in a band, right? And, it, you know, the, he's Italian. He said like, he moved from Italy to Spain. And, you know, and he said that being in this band really is everything sex, drugs and rock and roll. Like it really is that. And he was drinking and doing drugs to such an excessive level that even now that he loves music and he wishes he could, you know, get back in the band and perform again, he wouldn't do it just because of the fact that there's too much temptation mm. and, you know, the kind of like the energy that surrounds it is yeah. a little bit too um, dark for him. So now he just does art, right? And he yeah. sells the most incredible art and he has the most amazing artists on his platform. And yeah, so I just thought I'd share that with you. Well, that's very, that's, no, I can really relate with that because um, like art, I always have to be creatively stimulated in some way. Otherwise I start to go a little bit crazy. And so I started doing art actually as part of my therapy in the first rehab I went to. And um, ever since then, it's just become like my main thing. Like I'm, that's what I'm doing and um, I love it. It's, and it's like, there's no danger of me going out into the spiral of, you know, I need a drink now, please. Right. So with oh. you, with you, was it, was it, is it alcohol or is it drugs? What, what is it, or is it a combination? It's anything that changes how I feel. Right. Basically. So for me, it's like, it's like a game of whack-a-mole. It's like, I'll conquer one thing and then another thing pops up and I just have to be on my A game all the time. It's, I guess I'd say my first, my first drug was food. Um, I was an overeater as a kid, you know, I, I was the, the girl that stuffed food into her face at the party until she was sick and then she'd keep doing it. I mean, that's not really normal behavior. Um, and then when I was, I think alcohol started to become a thing in my 20s. And, but as soon as I tried Coke, I loved it. Um, and that became the reason why I went into rehab the first time. I went to some very, very, very dark places during that time. And I will be discussing that in my book. Um, and 
it changed me as a person. It changed me into somebody that I didn't recognize anymore, that I, you know, I was never a little girl and dreamed of being that person, you know, who steals bottles of wine because she's that shaking, you know. It's, it was a really, really dark time, but basically I'm, I'm here living proof that you can be the lowest of the low in your life and you can, you can actually recover. Like, you, you can start to remember who you are I forgot who I was for a really long time. I just got lost in this identity of sex, drugs, rock and roll. And it's all rubbish. Like, it just doesn't mean anything. And I can't remember anything, really. I, I used to go into blackouts. And then so it was the coke and then it was the alcohol. I thought after I left rehab the, the first time, I thought, oh, well. Uh, rehab... when, was, when, was the, when was rehab? When was that the first time? Uh, rehab the first was uh, 2017. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that was a posh rehab. Oh. Um, my grandma sent me there as sort of like a desperate thing, bless her, you know. And um, that recovery lasted for about seven months. And I was sort of still in denial about the alcohol. I just thought, well, I've got a, I've got a Coke problem. So, you know, I can still have a drink. No, I cannot. <laughs> um, it gets very, very, very ugly very quickly. And they say each time you relapse, it gets a little bit worse. And oh, really? I've come to find that that is very, very true. So, you know, I go from drunk to suicidal in a very short amount of time. And it's actually scary, the places mentally that you can be taken to. So, you know, if, if anybody out there feels like they're struggling with not being able to stop drinking, there are there are resources out there. There's twelve step fellowships. There's rehabs. There's people you can talk to. You know, talk to me. You know, talk talk to somebody in in um, in recovery, and you can get out of it. I I was sitting on a windowsill preparing to jump in my lowest moment. Yeah, but I got myself out of it. I didn't jump out of that windowsill, and I'm sitting here, and I'm healthy, and I'm happy. And I love that, and that's the reason why your voice is uh, everyone's voice is important but right now your voice is super magnified because people need to hear you as there's so many people right now going through depression that do have these suicidal thoughts and can't come out of it so when you when you feel low right and i mean low when there's no alcohol or drugs involved I'm, i mean just you right because we all get depressions and especially us women right we have the time of the month etc so hormones you happen to have got me on that day <laughs> <laughs> seriously earlier on today i was ready to kill someone <laughs> no please please oh listen if you need to cry don't worry we know it's a hormonal no, it's situation fine. I've it earlier it's fine i'll put it out of the way <laughs> so so georgie what i'm saying is when when you feel down and when you feel like you just don't want to go on when you look back what have you done to yourself how have you coached yourself to pull yourself out of that state to be like snap out of it do you know sometimes i know that when i'm in it personally like it feels like i'm at the bottom of a well and i can't get out it's dark and i can't get out and actually i don't know i just have to trust that everything that I have ever needed has been provided for me. If I, if I, okay, I'm, I'm here sitting to you and I'm healthy and I have a roof over my head and food in my fridge, right? I wouldn't have had to worry all those times leading up until now, because guess what? I'm fine. And it's just that faith knowing that there is something out there that's bigger than me. It doesn't have to be like a Christian God or any religious body God. Like for me, it's, it's the universe, sometimes it's my dead grandma, you know, or I'm quite like ghosty like that. But, um, and I just have to, you know, know that something has my back. Something has kept me here for all these years and everything has worked out okay. The only time that it doesn't work out okay is when I take my will back and don't follow the will of um, the universe, which is that I be sober and a productive human being. When I take my will back and I decide to put something toxic in my system, for me, like drugs or alcohol, that's when things don't work out. And I have enough written evidence from this book that I'm doing and all, all of my step work and things like that to realize that, like, yeah, uh, if I just trust 
all I have to do is not drink, not pick up a drug, and generally like be a nice person, but but mean it, I'll be fine. And also, if I'm feeling bad, to the quickest way is to get out of self. So think about somebody else, like call up somebody else that you know is having a bad time, and just just to be able to be there and feel useful to somebody else. That that saves me every single time. And, and you know, in those in those low moments, I mean, I've spoken to some people and they say, you know, it's easier said than done. You don't understand. It's really hard to be able to pull yourself out of it and be grateful and have gratitude and start thinking about all the good things and blah blah blah. And they and they get really frustrated and really upset when when I you know I've tried to reach yeah. out from that type of that kind of perspective, right? And but so. So I get lost because I'm like, well, so how can I reach out to you and get you to change your mindset in that moment if it's so difficult to do that? I think it it really varies from person to person. And I know that when I'm in the pits, you know, I sometimes I don't want to get out. Sometimes I'm enjoying myself in there a little bit. You know, the melancholiness of it, that this is a comfortable feeling. I, I know how to feel despair actually sometimes happiness is a little bit uncomfortable because I'm not used to it, you know? So in order to get out of that place, for me personally, what usually works is distraction. So just to be ta physically taken and placed somewhere else sometimes works and then just doing something for somebody else. And it's the last thing that I want to do in that situation, but it always works. And so- Giving giving yeah just 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 feeling useful you know um but but i do get that like like earlier today when i was having my like period tantrum <laughs> i was just like <laughs> no no nobody can cheer me up i was kicking pillows and all that stuff you know sometimes you just gotta let it out <laughs> you know there's nothing wrong with having a little cry and a scream every now and again i think it's important it releases our emotions and the fact is that we are human right we can't yeah. always like project this image like we are so happy we are like living in wisteria lane it just it just doesn't really work like that i don't buy it from people when they like plaster their perfect life everywhere i don't especially I, with I, social I media it. yeah and it's it's a competitive thing and I, I i find it quite amusing sometimes but i also find it quite sad that people feel they have to put on a show for everyone all the time because i know how that feels i've done it myself and it's torture <laughs> well it must have been really difficult for you because like you said you were in the public eye mm. and you were being scrutinized you were being criticized you know and amongst that you were also getting these like amazing compliments as well which i guess must have been really nice for any person's ego just to feel like oh wow that you know people you know do like me and people do want to see me but then all of a sudden you were getting slapped at the same time so it was almost like you know the public eye was your narcissistic sociopathic abuser yeah. where where it was loving you but hating you loving you but hating you mm. and it was it, that must have been really tricky for you like how did you deal with that well for a long time um i kind of had the blinkers on like i i was terrified of newspapers i didn't want to be near them i didn't want to touch them and i just kind of like filtered my eyes out when i walked past one I sort of, any any press that I was involved in, I didn't want to look at. I had a friend read it for me. Um, I just sort of blinkered myself off from it because I had to, you know. And then all of the, um, all of the chubby goth comments and stuff like that, they took their toll and I ended up with quite a serious eating disorder, um, you know. And I don't want to talk too much about that because I don't think I'm really in a position right now to, you know, give any advice on that it's still something that I'm working on um but at the moment you know the main focus is staying sober <laughs> absolutely and also for you to be focusing on such productive things like you're doing because you're obviously a very 
creative individual it oozes out of you whether you know you want to say yeah but you know i was never a singer whatever it may be you are a creative person from acting from singing from dancing from artwork from you know book writing sharing you know you, it's all art and um and that's you you're an artistic person and a very expressive person and i think it's that <laughs> yeah. oh that's true expressive you could, yeah, you, you could are. Ask a few of my ex-boyfriends about that one. Well, <laughs> imagine if you imagine if you were born Colombian like me, you would be a you would be like literally like throwing eggs and, and I could, yeah, anything I could find, I'd throw. Yeah, you should have seen me a couple of hours ago. Be a mob wife. <laughs> You'd be a mob wife. Um, so, Georgie, tell me, I then this is something that I really want to know. You must have met so many famous people in your lifetime, okay? Obviously, your grandfather is one of them. But can you name me some celebrities that you have met in your life? Okay. Uh, let's go back into the memory bank here. Go um, into the memory bank. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So we've got, um, well, John Cleese I met. Uh, I met him at a summer party at his house. He was very, very lovely. But it, I was very young. I can't really remember it that well. Uh, who else have I met? Um, oh, I've met quite a few uh, 80s pop stars, obviously, from uh, working with Adam. I, I met... Uh, Are you still in contact with Adam? Uh, sadly not. You know, things... You know, I went my way, he went his. But, it um, is what it is. It is what it is, and he gave me three amazing years of touring the world and, and, and performing in front of thousands of people, and I have nothing but gratitude for that, so yeah. Beautiful, and I think, like we were saying before, I think one of the things to counteract um, negative thoughts is gratitude, right? So just the fact that you've just said, I'm so grateful for those three years and everything that gave to you, because it must have been an incredible experience to be on stage in front of thousands of people. It was. However, um, sometimes the audience was a little bit hostile because at the time um, I was in my 20s and I was often performing in underwear um, and, you know, a lot of Adam's female fans were in the audience and they did not like a young girl in her knickers singing next to the guy they want to shag, basically. Oh, that's <laughs> so jealousy. In, I remember this one gig in Texas. I was dodging ice cubes the whole gig because there was this woman in the front chucking these ice cubes at me. And, uh, but you know what? It, it made the whole experience uh, just a little bit more memorable. But you do <laughs> know that that was jealousy, right? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I know that, you know. And actually, I was, I, I seem to remember being fine with it. Like, I was just having such a great time. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like it was just awesome. Did Adam and was he on top of the pops? Adam. Yeah. Yeah, he was on top of the pops. I wasn't born yet, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm 36, right? And I'm not married, and I've got no kids. So do you know awesome. what? I, I I so need to hear you talk. Carry on. <laughs> How do you do it? No, I'm because so you freaked out. Because you mentioned before, like, you know, you were saying your age and how, you know, you feel that, you know, I don't know, this whole being left on the shelf thing. And I've had moments where I've also felt the same thing. And and I, I'm a complex character, you know, I really I don't take a lot of shit from anyone. Yeah. And um because I understand that a lot of people are out to um I don't know bring you down in a way because they don't feel good about themselves and so and it's my pet hate you know as soon as I spot it it makes me I use it as fuel to want to do better and do more but what's happened is that by being so ambitious and and being so you know strong and setting my ways with regards to progression right it's actually not allowed me to find uh, a man because men are also wanting to have that role, right? And it's always mm -hmm. been kind of like a man's role to be very, you know, a business owner and the one that makes the money and the one that does this. And, and I'm very much like, well, actually, no, I can do that as well. So if you just want to move along. Um, and so they, they don't like that. And I think to myself, well, okay, what's going to happen then? Am I going to end up on my own? You know, I, I, 
am I never going to have my own family or, you know, have that love that you see on social media of this 2.4 family? And, you know, the way that I see it is there is a side to every story. Yeah. And I know so many people that have these 2.4 family and they're living in hell. Mm -hmm. And it's better to live alone and happy than to be with someone and feel alone if that makes sense i know i know exactly what you mean because i've i've sort of been in that position before and it is awful you know and the thing is for me like i have not been mentally in a position to be in any kind of relationship for a very very long time and i think what you said about you know gender roles and all that like about um how men probably find what you do intimidating well for me it's I've never really been financially motivated <laughs> um but I am very sort of driven and I'm I'm very sort of I guess sexually overt you know I I'm sort of my body language is flirty and I have been told that you know I come across in a certain way but I've sort of learned to realize that that's just how I am. It's just me. And if somebody can't handle that, they can move along, you know? You know, if someone can't handle who you are, those aren't your people. Yeah. Those aren't your people. Your people will never judge you. Your people will love you for who you are, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to judge me, you see, I always pay attention to people that don't clap for me when I win, right? I pay really, sometimes you really, you know, it's funny because throughout this whole pandemic, and this whole lockdown, we've all had time to really kind of like be in our houses, we've got no choice, and to slow down and to think. And now that I look back from when this all started for us, which is what, a couple of months ago, to now, I think to oh, myself, yeah. oh my oh my goodness, there are so many people that I no longer want to speak to um, and associate myself with anymore because actually, I wasn't admitting it to myself then, but subconsciously they were quite toxic for me and they were not doing certain things that a genuine person that loves you would do. So actually they're not going to be coming out with out of lockdown with me. They're going to be staying there. And, you know, I think it's important to be able to be brave enough to say to yourself, well, you know, I love you and every, and you know, you've been great, but actually I'm going to move on. Yeah. Totally. And I think another reason to get people to move along is like, you know, they're not, you, you have to meet someone, you know, what, what I consider to be important in a relationship, somebody else might not. So it's values, isn't it? Like one of my values is that in the beginning, you, you know, you, you're texting each other constantly. But if that starts to dwindle after like two weeks, they ain't the guy for you. No. <laughs> and also, I think one thing that women seem to get very confused is that honeymoon period, okay? That honeymoon period doesn't mean love, right? You really got to go through the past that honeymoon period and then start to really see who this person is and whether this person loves you, yes or, yes or no, yeah. right? And a lot of people are like, no, I'm going to get married. He's the one. Yes, this is it. And it's like, you know, celebration here and celebration there. I think you really got to give a relationship uh, at least a year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Before you act. And a lot of people are rushing into things. They're rushing into marriage. They're rushing into so much. And I think slow down. Because as I was saying to you before about, you know, I take a look at all these people that have this so-called 2.4 families. And really behind closed doors, you know, it's, it's upside down. Yeah. Um, it's because there, there's a there's a lot of rushing and a rushing to I'm 36 I need to get married I need to have children rushing because society's telling me that if I don't I'm going to be old and left on the shelf and it looks like I've got problems in my head and now everyone's going to judge me <laughs> yeah. right because I get that I think you know people are gonna I know people you know subconsciously look at me and probably be like she's a tough one that one I know I get that from people too <laughs> seriously they're like what's wrong with her why is she on her own in her 30s you get it and you get it you get it when you walk away and you're not even there to listen to it you get it i know you get it because i know i've got that sixth sense where i can feel it and it's okay 
it's fine. Let everyone talk because this is what we were saying in the beginning, right? Everyone's journey is so unique and there is no other person who is you in this world. There is no other Georgina Bailey in this world. There isn't. You are the only person. You, it's your superpower, right? And when you actually look at it like that and you think, there's not another person like me in this world, I'm fucking unique. Sorry to swear. That's all right. I all the... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just got a little bit passionate and used the F word. Uh, bleep. <laughs> I'm going to get Paul to uh, bleep that out. <laughs> oh, make it authentic. Keep it in. <laughs> so... But, the, but do, you, do, you, do you hear what I'm saying? It's just yes. like, oh. Yes, and it's like, it's that narrative that has kept me awake at night before. You know, it's, it's just like, but what you're saying is totally countering it. Like, there is only one of me, and I'm unique. And sometimes for certain other people, like, that's too much, you know. Like, but like we said, that's not your people. Yeah. Bye-bye. See ya. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? It's like, Actually, I've given you too much of this amazing energy so you can move along. Because I love that way of looking at it. That's brilliant. But it's, but it's, but Georgie, it's completely and utterly true. You know, again, with this masterclass, I keep going back to it, um, but I had to do so much research for it. And one of the guys that I use is Steve Harvey. I don't know if you know who Steve Harvey is, but he's like this motivational comedian. Okay. And he wrote this book, Think Like a Lady, Act Like a Man. And he's absolutely hilarious, right? But he's also into motivation. And he, and he, you know, speaks to an audience and he gets them all pumped. And yes, I can. And, you know, one of the things that he says is we all have a gift. Every single one of us, right? And the purpose in life is to find out what that gift is. And then once you know what your gift is, is to give it away, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the giving and the, and, and the gratification that you feel for it, right? But giving from the heart and giving freely, right? So what is your gift? For example, he gave some examples. He was like, KFC, right? One person started doing that for the love of frying chicken. He loved frying chicken so much, right? That, that's what he concentrated on, was frying chicken, right? And now KFC is in almost every country in the world, yeah. right? Then he was talking about this, a guy that he grew up with when he was a kid. And this child used to love cutting grass, right? He was like, he used to charge $2 for the front, $2 for the back, right? And he was cutting grass. You mean, he could do all sorts of weird artistic things with this grass, right? And then... Steve Harvey and his friends would be like, come on, let's go out and, you know, let's have fun. He'd be like, no, no, I can't because I have to cut, you know, so-and-so's grass tomorrow. And I said that I would. And they'd laugh at him and they'd mock him. And he was like, do you know what we're laughing at now? He's one of the biggest landscape com companies in America. He cuts grass. He now does the whole snow plowing where he puts machines and he gets all the snow in Cleveland. He's just like, he's like worth millions and millions. So what I'm saying is people think that your gift has to be something crazy and insane when really your gift is something very, very simple. It's what you love and what you're good at. And when you find that, and then when you give it away, you don't need a man. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? A lot of recovery is, um, well, actually, there's been a lot of studies. Sustained happiness is giving away what you've been given so like um in recovery they say in order to keep it you have to give it away and that makes actually a lot, a lot of sense that. because you know what what was so freely given to me the me this method of recovery in order for me to keep it i have to teach it to somebody else and wow. so in teaching it to somebody else i'm reminded of all the things that i learned the first time around and that's how it just keeps going. And remember I said, you know, when um, I'm really depressed and I have to, in order to get out of it, I get out of myself and think about somebody else and do something for somebody else. It's all the same principle. All the same principle. And, and you know what? I'm now going to be working on something else called the 12 keys to riches, right? 
and it's 12 keys that you need to have in order to be able to succeed in whatever it is that you want in your life right and success to be successful doesn't necessarily mean to have lots of money so let's not get it twisted right because a lot of people nice, <laughs> it would be nice it helps um <laughs> it helps um <laughs> for sure so um one you know there are so many keys i call them and you know one of them is gratitude mm -hmm. the other is giving right the other one is consistency consistency in whatever it is that you are trying to do consistency if you are trying to take a business off the ground and make it big consistency in you know you've been sober for three years you've got to make it the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh it's consistency right so that's another key to one of the 12 keys of riches so it's really exciting it's something that's coming soon but it's fundamentally what you were saying about I think when I first spoke to you in this interview, you said to me, well, one of the, you know, the things that they tell us to do in recovery is to write our own stories. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has been so successful about self-made girl boss is that women are writing their stories and putting pen to paper, sending it in something they never thought that they would want to do because why would anyone be bothered or interested in me? And all of a sudden, you know, self-made girl boss is, they're putting pen to paper, they're writing down, they're being honest, they're being authentic and vun they're allowing themselves to be vulnerable, right? Without being feared of being judged because that's what our platform is all about, that we will never judge you <laughs> because I've had girls here that have been raped. I've had girls here that were caught in a fire and have literally um, burns all over their bodies. I've had girls, I've, you name it, I've had it. And every single one of these women is beautiful and wonderful and strong and their story is go it's actually giving me look my hairs on my arms are like literally yeah you know and their story is literally touching the souls of someone in africa or mm -hmm. someone in australia or you know someone in england and that's exactly what's going to happen here with you now and also yeah. when you write your book and when you finally you know publish it and sell it which i think is going to be amazing yeah so, so georgina it takes me on to my last question it's the question that i ask everyone and that question is if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing in the world what uh. would it... <laughs> don't worry this isn't, this isn't, you're, this is an exam. It's, you're not going to pass or fail. It's your answer, right? You could change one thing in the world. What would it be? And why? <laughs> I don't know why I did it in that creepy voice. Yeah. Oh my God. What a question. I mean, I'm going to, I know there's tell, lots of things. I'm going to tell you my truth. Uh, my truth is that I would like all of the alcohol and drugs removed from the earth. I, 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 I agree with you because unfortunately it's a substance that can be easily misused and also celebrated in a way that if you take it, it's funny. You don't need to worry about it and you're cool and you know, you can have it and it's, because I used to I used to live in Monaco, right? And I lived there for a number of years. And in Monte Carlo, you, you know, you get youngsters that are born in an excessive amount of money and they're being let into, you know, nightclubs such as mm -hmm. Jimmy's and Sass Cafe, et cetera, et cetera, in Monaco. And, you know, there's a lot of drugs and alcohol. And, you know, like back in the day, how here it was like, you have a cigarette and it makes you look cool at 12 yeah, yeah, years yeah. old. You know, these people in Monaco are doing it, you know, a line of cocaine and then it gets harder and harder and harder drugs, mm -hmm. right? Which becomes, you know, more difficult to be able to come out of it, like heroin, for example, and things like that. So um, I agree with you. I think that would be amazing to just remove that from the world. Well, there's just, there's a lot of things attached to it, you know, like women get into prostitution, mm. men get into prostitution, um, people get murdered 
over, over drugs. You know, it's it's got a lot. I mean, I know some people can use it recreationally, but I mean, I've looked at those people and they all turn into twats. <laughs> it's just not nice. Yeah. So anyway, that's my answer. I think that's a fantastic answer. So thank you so much for answering that. And I just want to say once again, thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to speak with me and with everyone else that is watching and, and for, for being vulnerable and for sharing with us, uh, you know, who you are. And um, I think you're remarkable. I think you're doing so well and you should be very proud of yourself for every day plowing through you know Winston Churchill said um you know if you're going through hell keep going yeah because why would anyone want to stay there no <laughs> no thank you so much for having me my pleasure darling All please right. stay in touch oh yeah same here Mwah. take care bye bye